Hey, my friends, it's Mrs. Real here with another installment of Jed in the Junkyard War. This is going to be, we've got like two or three chunks of reading left to do to get to the end of this book. And I can't wait. I'm so curious as to what's going on. So last we left Jed and Shay and Sprocket and the captain had all been captured by the dreads. And they were sailing on their ship to the Dread King's territory. They've been going through this fog forever and ever and ever. And they realized that Shay has been there before. She does not quite remember it. She kind of goes in and out of knowing where they're going and not knowing what's happening, but she always knows what's going to happen. And as they pulled up, they saw the Dread King's ship. And he said it was like a ship he'd seen and read about in history and seen in movies about the Revolutionary War. It was like nothing in the junkyard. Long golden planks bowed around its surface in a brick-like pattern, every plank matching its neighbor. The gold surface shimmered in the darkness like the dawning sun. Three red sails billowed on each of the tall masts. So that's where they said, where Shay said that their, Jed's grandfather was taken. He was captured from his ship and taken on board that ship. So Jed has decided they're going to get the captain and Sprocket and Shay off the boat and then he's off and then they're going to, he's going to go find his grandfather on that ship. So that's where we're going to start today. Chapter 29. Sprocket opened the door to the captain's quarters and peeked out. Clear. One by one, they darted into the corridor. Jed nodded. Okay, Shay, show us. She smiled and bolted down the hallway. Great, Sprocket said. This again? Shay stopped by a door and opened it to reveal a mop and a bucket. Jed assessed the closet. This should work. They squeezed inside and Jed opened the door just a crack. Before long, a group of dread hobbled past. Sprocket swung open the door, slamming it against the first dread. It toppled to the floor. Jed leaped out, leaped on a second dread, swinging his fists. Shay danced around the third as if it was a, no, a game. The dread slashed at her. She smiled and bent over backward. Her left foot kicked the blade from the dread's hand. The dread lunged forward, but she dodged and ran. It stumbled and Sprocket cracked the butt of her shadow lance against its head. Once all three dread were motionless on the floor, Jed pulled a pair of boots off one of them and measured them against his own feet. Sprocket took off her perfectly maintained trench coat, folded it neatly, and set it beside the dread. She cringed as she removed the creature's oil-soaked shirt and pulled it over her own. Jed pointed to the trench coat. You won't pass for a dread wearing that. You have to get rid of it. Sprocket shook her head. I've been around more corners of the junkyard than anyone. Never seen a coat I liked as much as this. If it's not dready enough for them, then I'll just deal with it. Jed nodded. Okay, then just know that I'm heartbroken for having to do this. Having to do what? She asked. Jed pulled a knife from a dread and slashed a gaping hole in Sprocket's coat. Her eyes stretched wider even than Pobble's ping pong ball stare. She reached for the coat, but Jed slashed again. You clunk piece of... Jed swiped a third time, then nodded. That should do it. Now it'll pass for a dread coat. Sprocket shook with rage. I'm going to strangle you with your own shoelaces. See, Jed said, you even sound like a dread now. Sprocket's hands clenched into fists and her eyes burned with murder. Shay stuffed pipes and scraps of metal into a baggy set of tattered clothes. When she was dressed, she twirled in front of the others. How do I look? She asked. Perfect, Jed said. Sprocket mumbled something to herself and pulled on the rest of her clothes. They moved what was left of the bodies into the closet. Then, in their best hobble, they shuffled down the corridor after Shay. You know where Captain Bog is? Sprocket asked. Mm-hmm. Shay said. You seem to know a lot, Sprocket said. Oh, yes, Shay nodded. I do know a lot. I know that when you got Golog, when you pull Golog slugs, they can stretch twice their body length before they snap and all the goopy stuff inside them falls out. I know that white paper doesn't taste good after two sheets and brown paper after three. I also know that... That's all fascinating, Sprocket interrupted, but how do you know where we're going? I want a real answer, not a Shay answer. Shay paused and thought for a moment. Fourteen. Fourteen? Yes, fourteen. Shay nodded once, then turned around and kept walking. I hate her, Sprocket mumbled. 
chapter 30. Shay, stop, Jeff called, Jed called. He ran to catch her. When they caught up, Shay stood next to a staircase. Sprocket grabbed her by both shoulders. This is important, she said. There's going to be a lot of dread up there, so we can't run, okay? Of course not, said Shay. That's not very sneaky. We're dread, remember? Sprocket nodded. Yes, we're dread. Shay wagged a scolding finger at Sprocket. So no running around, all right? Yes, Sprocket agreed. No running around. Good dread. All right, let's see if we can see who we've got here. In our picture with their costumes on, their disguises on. Hopefully they can escape. They climbed to the main deck. The fog hovered around them like a misty sky. The deck was a patchwork of compressed junk stacked like bricks. A warped plunger, a broken fishing pole, and a scuffed paintbrush were all embedded into the junk around Jed's feet. Dozens of smokestacks jutted out from the dreadnought at crooked angles with no particular order. Some were feet apart from one another, while others were isolated. Are you sure the captain is out here? Sprocket asked. Shay smiled. Of course not, silly. That's why we're looking. But you didn't really mean to ask that, did you? You're just a lazy mouse, that's all. I... Sprocket opened her mouth. Either that or a scaredy mouse. Sprocket closed her mouth and kept walking. Shay nodded. At the next stack, Shay pointed to a large grate on the deck. They walked to the grate and peered inside. A gray sack lay under the deck in a small, boxy pit. Captain, Jed whispered. The sack squirmed. Jed, a muffled voice answered. Is that you? And me, Shay squeaked. Hold still, Captain, Sprocket said. She removed the shadow lens from her back and aimed it at the lock. Don't, Jed said. The dread, though. A crack sounded, and a beam of white dust splashed against the deck. The lock burst into three pieces. Sprocket lifted the grate, then dove into the pit and cut the captain free. Where's the rest of the crew, he asked, pulling the strands away from his face. It's just us, Jed said. Captain Bog nodded. Well, now that every dread on the ship knows where we are. As if his words had called them, the deck clicked with the uneven gate of dread. Let's find a life raft, Sprocket suggested. Captain Bog shook his head. They just blast us out of the sky. We need another way off this ship. I'm not leaving the barge, Jed said. The others looked at him. Stop saying that, Sprocket said. We're all leaving, and that includes you. Not until I find my grandfather. What's he blathering on about, the captain asked. Shay told me that when the steamboat was attacked, they took my grandfather to the Red Galleon. Jed pointed at the red ship hovering in the distance. To the Dread King. The captain's face went rigid. Jed, I know firsthand what the Dread King does to people like you and me and your grandfather. He calls us meat sacks. And you know what he does to meat sacks? Jed's heart thudded. Shay said he makes people drink engine oil. The, the captain lifted his brows as if surprised that Jed knew. He does. I've seen it. His throat quivered. Your daughter, Jed thought. A sick feeling prickled through him, and it was suddenly hard to swallow. I have to try, Jed said, just like you had to for your daughter. And you'd do it all over, wouldn't you? Captain Bog was quiet for a long moment. Okay. Sprocket's jaw slackened. Okay? Did you just say okay? The captain grabbed Jed's shoulder and limped forward. We need to find a place to hide. He waved the others forward, but a pack of dread spotted them. The clicking of their footsteps rattled faster. Run, Sprocket said. Together, they dragged the captain along the deck. Another pack of dread saw them and moved in from another angle. More dread added to the packs by the second, until hundreds of them closed in from every side. There's nowhere to go, Sprocket shouted. Dread fo everywhere formed a tight circle around them. Spyglass pushed to the front of the pack and drew his shatterbox. Chapter 31. How nice to see you all again, Spyglass said, just like old times, except now I have legs. And this, he waggled the shatterbox in the air, and 2,000 dread. He touched his belly. I'm curious, are any of you hungry? Because I'm starving. 
Shay, Jed whispered, get ready to... He looked behind him, but Shay was gone. Look what I found, Shay's voice called from above. Shay looked up. Shay, or Jed looked up, Shay. She stood on top of a crate, holding a fire extinguisher above her head. Everyone stopped and stared, even Spyglass. What should we do with the fire extinguisher? What are you doing, Shay? The captain said with a get out of here while you still can tone to his voice. I found one of the gilded relics. She held the fire extinguisher higher. You what? She nodded. It was over there. She pointed off somewhere nondescriptly, just laying on the deck. Shay, get out of here, the captain said. She hopped down from the crate and walked toward them. Dread parted as she passed. An eerie feeling swam over Jed. What's going on, Shay? he whispered. This, she handed the fire extinguisher to Captain Bog, is one of the gilded relics. It's a special one that makes scritches do whatever you want. Captain Bog searched the twisted faces around him. None of the creatures, excuse me, none of the creatures moved. Try it, Shay said with a squeal. Captain Bog took the fire extinguisher and held it like it was about to explode. He looked from Shay to the dread and then back to the fire extinguisher. Makes them do fun things like jump on one leg or act like scritch mice, Shay said, clapping her hands. Do it, do it. He limped toward the edge of the circle and the dread parted. Act, um, he looked at the extinguisher again, like scritch mice? Dread began walking around the deck on all fours in their best scritch mice impressions. Even Spyglass dropped his shatterbox and crouched to the floor, hobbling about on hands and knees. What is that? Sprocket said, studying the fire extinguisher. I told you, isn't it fun? How did you, Jed began, over there, she pointed again, just lying on the ground. Lucky, right? Lucky? Captain Bog mumbled, sounding almost scared of Shay. Now you can be the captain of this boat, too. Stoke the engines, grind the crank gears, that sort of thing. So where to, Captain? Silence filled the deck. Everyone stared at her. What's going on, Shay? The captain asked. Jed stepped away from Spyglass, who was still on all fours. We need to get Jed to the Red Galleon, right? Shay said. I bet if you ask the crew, they'll help. We should probably do that soon, yes? Shay? Captain Bog drew out the word like a parent accusing a child of something. Yes? What's going on? She shrugged. I already told you, and time's running out. He looked at Sprocket. What's going on with her? I've been asking myself that for weeks. We can talk in the captain quarters in the captain's quarters if you'd rather, Shay said, seeing as how you're the captain now, yes? She turned and skipped back the way they'd come. Shay, wait, Captain Bog called, limping after her. Don't even try, Sprocket mumbled. As Jed turned to follow, he glanced back at Spyglass. The dread was staring at him, and there was something in his eyeless face. It was small, almost unnoticeable. But Jed noticed. It was the faint hint of a smirk. Wow. I'm not sure I totally understand what's happening here. Let's find out. Chapter 32. Back in the Dreadnought's captain quarters, the four stared out the porthole at the Red Galleon. We can't just expect to float over there and jump on board, Sprocket said. Sprocket's right, Captain Bog said. They'll get you before you hit the deck. Not not if they can't see us, Jed said. What if we use the same idea you had against the wing of Fal that wing of falcons? Fly as close as we can, then pop some cloud bombs around both ships. He looked at the captain. Can you fly this thing? Maybe. Bessie was a dread tug last I checked. Here, Shay said, holding the fire extinguisher to the captain. Don't forget your gilded relic. Right, wouldn't want to leave it laying around, would I? Nope. Jed, Shay, and Sprocket stood at the edge of the dreadnought, holding the ends of their coiled rope ladders. Closer, Jed mumbled to himself, a little bit closer. 
With Captain Bog at the helm, the dreadnought drifted near the galleon. A pop sounded and a cloud bomb launched into the air. It exploded and a shroud of smoke billowed around the two ships in the tidal black wave of black. Now, Jed said, dropping the rope ladder. Rung by run, he descended until his feet no longer felt additional rungs. His jaw tensed and his breath stopped. Where was the galleon deck? He squinted, but the black smoke was too thick. What if they weren't above the galleon? They'd fall all the way to the barge. Either the ladders were too short or they were dangling above open air. Heroism, he told himself, thinking of spaghetti. He sucked in a deep breath and let go. He fell through the air air, his heart in his throat. Jed's feet slammed against something solid. The others dropped beside him. Shay, Sprocket, he whispered. Two hands reached out and touched his shoulders. We need to hide before the smoke lifts, Sprocket said. I don't see anything. What if we run off the edge? I see something, Shay said. A crate. She grabbed Jed's hand. They ducked behind a large box and waited for the smoke to clear. When the darkness lifted, Jed turned around. Six dread stood in a semicircle around them. Jed drew his shatterbox and fired. One of the dread burst apart. Sprocket drew her shatter lance and shot the other five before Jed could pull the trigger again. All around them, limping steps clattered through the smoke. Sprocket fired again and again. Dread crashed against the deck. More footsteps. Dozens. Hundreds. The steady clatter evolved into a thundering stampede. Jed shot by blindly into the smoke. Metal scraps showered over the deck, but the dread continued to march. I'll go find a shatter keg, Shay said. There's one nearby. Shay, no, don't go by yourself. She bounded away as if she hadn't heard Jed. A moment later, wheels squeaked beside him and something pressed against his legs. He reached down and found a shatter keg lever. He punched a button and a boom shook the deck. The sound of broken crates and pieces of the ship echoed through the air. He thought of the surrounding dreadnoughts, the hundreds of warships. They're all going to come. Thousands of dread, hundreds of thousands. Even if we survive, even if we take the whole ship, it won't matter. We won't escape. Jed fired the shatter keg again and bits of metal sprayed the deck. Shadows surrounded them, black shapes through the smoke arms outstretched. Shay leaped forward like a cat toward its prey. Sprocket tapped the trigger of her shadow lance so quickly the chain of shots dyed the blackened air with blue lines of smoke until she th pulled the trigger once more and there was only a click. She dropped the shadow lance and drew two shatter boxes. Shots blasted through the smoke and dread collapsed. Two more clicks, two empty shatter boxes. Metal limbs clinked against the decks as hundreds of dread breached the smoke around them. That's enough, a voice called from the darkness. Weapons on the floor. The dread stopped. Weapons dropped to the deck. Shay scampered back to the others. Silence filled the air. Not a single dread moved. Their metal bodies stood like statues. The smoke lifted, and a figure walked toward Jed, the Dread King. Jed's dream played again in his mind. The oil forced down his throat, slippery and thick. Shay's, Shay's words rang in his head. He makes disobedient mice drink the same oil his engines drink, and then he watches them gurgle their last squeak. Smoke shrouded the Dread King's features, but Jed could see his sil silhouette. He held a box, then lifted its lid with a small creak. Jed, the music box, Shay yelled. The relic, able to put a room full of people to sleep. A melody trickled into the air, one note at a time. Shay tackled Jed and covered his ears. One by one, Dread crumpled to the floor. Sprocket teetered at their side. Her shatter lance clunked against the deck and she dropped to her knees. She swayed in place and fell. Shay's hands pressed against Jed's head and she hummed to herself. His heart beat faster. She's not falling asleep. Why isn't she falling asleep? Her hands lifted. The music stopped and the box clicked closed. The smoke had gone too. A man stood before him, a man with a big nose and a bushy mustache. No. Jed's blood froze in his veins, his ears throbbed and his lips went numb. This can't, 
No. The air around him felt heavy and pressed into him on all sides. I've been waiting for you, his grandfather's brutal voice said. What is going on? Chapter 33. Oh my gosh, you guys, we're going on. The man smiled and opened his arms. Jed stood, though his legs shook. How? Jed's voice fell away. Something clattered to the deck, his shatterbox. You're here, but how are you? The words, gone again. Come over and give your grandfather a hug. But Jed's ankles brushed against a dread. His grandfather closed the gap and wrapped lanky arms around him. What's, what's going on? Jed stared at the metal corpses. You're working for the dread? Heavens no, boy, he clapped Jed's shoulder. They're terrible creatures, absolutely horrid. Every word from his grandfather, even the sight of him surrounded by sleeping dread, felt like a scorpion sting piercing deep into his neck. He looked at a dread, and then another, and another. Their twisted frames. Then why are you... The world is in trouble, Jed. This world. Our world. We need to save it. Together, your family needs you. My family? Your family is bigger than you know, and they're dying. But you can save them. Save us all. I've waited nine years for your return. Nine years? Car seat, Jed mumbled. His head still felt packed with cotton. The thoughts, the memories. A blue car seat. You buckled me inside. And then I was falling. Why was I falling? His grandfather squeezed Jed's shoulder. I'm sure you have many questions. I'll answer them all, I promise. But there's much you need to learn. I want to show you something. He hooked his arm around Jed. No, Jed turned around. Sprocket, she's, she'll be just fine. She's only sleeping. I'll stay with her, Shay said. Shay's voice broke Jed's mind from the shock. He'd nearly forgotten about her. She stood next to Sprocket. Her hands clasped in front of her as she stared at the deck. The music box, you didn't fall asleep, he said to her. Shay's special, his grandfather said. Aren't you, Shay? Shay looked at the deck. I'm special. The words sounded stiff, like they'd been etched into her mind after a thousand repeti repeti repetitions. Are you all right, Jed asked. She didn't look up. I'm fine. Go. I'll stay with Sprocket. We'll be back before you can blink, his grandfather said. But Jed hesitated. Shay's gaze stayed fixed on the floor as his grandfather pulled him away. They wandered the pristine, empty deck until they reached a staircase to the lower deck. The walls and flooring were dark brown planks. The wood was treated, stained, and lacquered. Jed touched a wall. It was slick and new. The varnish still had a sweet scent. He ran his fingers along the perfectly fitted boards. How did you find these? They all match. His grandfather smiled. Ah, yes, wonderful craftsmanship. I'm quite pleased. But where? Where did you get it? From home. What home? There are secrets in this world meant just for us. Wonderful secrets. Beautiful secrets. Secrets that would enchant even those who've lived beyond the fringe. He gripped the knob of an oak door and twisted. A lush garden blossomed behind the open door. Bright tomatoes nearly glowed on their vines. Sprouts of turnips, carrots, cabbages, and onions. Purple sprigs of lavender next to plump marigolds. A delicate blue orchid under a hydrangea bush. Rows of herbs, thyme, basil, parsley, and cilantro. Jed's foot sank slightly as he walked. Rich soil blanketed the floor in dark brown. He scooped a handful of it and held it to his face. The damp earth filled his nostrils as he took a deep breath. The particles crumbled through his fingers and he brushed his hands together. A glint of yellow caught his eye. In the center of the room, in full bloom, was something he could describe no better than wonder. A lemon tree. 
tall and magnificent, its branches arching over the other plants like a mother's safe arms. His grandfather walked in front of him and sniffed the air. Ah, can you smell that? Jed inhaled. A wave of nostalgia coursed through him. He was home again, peeling lemons for his mother's pancake, flipping through the pages of the Lemon Anthology for Lemon Saturday. He could hear her humming to herself as she sliced the lemons into wedges. Her apron, eternally dusted with flour and spotted with stains of a thousand meals. Do you still have it? His grandfather said, shattering the memory. Have what? He plucked another lemon from the tree, then scratched the rind and smelled it. His eyes closed. The lemon, of course. He opened his eyes and glanced at Jed's pocket. Jed took out the lemon. Its leathery rind was shriveled and dented. The orange blemishes had multiplied, discoloring the surface. His grandfather took the fruit and replaced it with the one he just picked. A fresh one for the road. We do love our lemons, don't we? Wouldn't want you to be without one. The new lemon was supple and rubbery, the way a lemon should feel. Jed looked up, but the wilted lemon was gone. A sting of loss pricked his heart, as if a piece of his parents had been ripped away. How did you know? Because I asked you to bring one with you. We have wonderful th things to make and we need every lemon we can get. He winked. Follow me. I have one more surprise. His mind so fuzzy. But every time Clarity struck long enough for him to ask another question, his grandfather walked off or spoke first. They left the garden and walked to the door across the corridor. His grandfather opened it and a sweet scent filled the air. A kitchen, much like his kitchen at home. Cherry cabinets, a frosted glass pantry, an iron stove, a granite topped island counter, and even a microwave. A ding sounded from the oven. Ah, just in time. His grandfather rubbed his palms together and strolled to the oven. He grabbed an oven mitt, then pulled out a wire rack. Lemon poppy seed donuts, the way mom makes them. Jed's heart raced. What's happening? He pressed his thumbnail into the back of his hand. It hurt. But so had the oil from the dream. Wake up, wake up. What was that? His grandfather asked. Nothing. The man dipped the freshly baked donut into a bowl of glaze long enough for it to soak to it, into its core. This isn't real. Here, he handed Jed the donut on a napkin. Try it. They're my favorite. Jed lifted the donut to his lips. Steam snaked up from the wet glaze. So sweet, so perfect. His teeth closed around the donut and the bite melted onto his tongue, just the way it did at home. A memory pushed its way to the front of his mind. The summer after he turned nine, his family had vacationed in Bangladesh. He'd come across an animal he later learned was called a slow loris. It was not much bigger than his shoe with large misty eyes. Its fur pulled into teardrops around the eyes, making it look vulnerable and frightened. It licked its elbow and cocked its head at Jed. He smiled back. Hi there, little guy. When he crouched, the loris lunged and sank its teeth into Jed's shoulder. Jed tried prying it off, but its skinny arms grasped his like hands of iron. His father ripped the loris away, but it was too late. Jed's muscles seized from the poison in his veins. He blacked out and woke in a hospital. From that day on, he'd already always remembered the eyes. Big, beautiful eyes. Harmless. Innocent. He'd been on more dangerous adventures than a boy his age should have been able to survive. But he had survived, because he'd learned to. And if there was one thing he'd learned over the years, it was to trust himself when something didn't feel right. Jed recognized poison behind innocent eyes. This isn't right. None of it is. What do you mean you'd asked me to bring it? Jed said. His grandfather lifted his eyebrows. What? The lemon. You said you'd asked me to bring one. I'll explain everything in time. Enjoy your donut. Jed set the donut onto the counter and backed away. His throat felt hot and shaking. You knew everything. The lemon? The donuts? How did you know? His voice roared through the room. 
His grandfather patted the air. Calm down, you're safe. Nobody's trying to hurt you. Safe? How could I have been so stupid? Shay, where is Shay? With your friend, don't you remember? And then he did remember. He remembered how she'd slumped, how she'd stared at the deck, hands clasped in front of her as if shielding herself from the man with the music box. You hurt her, Jed said. She told me you beat her with a pipe. That's absurd. Why would I do that? The dread, their fallen, twisted bodies. Don't lie to me. I know you hurt her. Listen to me. Shay's memory, it's broken. She doesn't remember things clearly. Maybe that's what happens when you hit people with pipes. His grandfather's jaw tightened. This was supposed to be a wonderful moment, a beautiful moment, he mumbled as if speaking to the floor. Now it's ruined. He slapped the wire rack of donuts. They flapped through the air and splattered over the glassy hardwood. Ruined. Jed backed toward the kitchen door. His grandfather stopped, raised his hand. Stop, please. I'm going to find my friends. I've had them taken elsewhere. They're being cared for, I promise. Promise? You promised to tell me what's going on. It's not that simple. But you're home. We have plenty of time to talk. Home? This isn't my home. I don't even know you. I'm your grandfather. No, whatever this is, it's not my grandfather. Where are my parents? What have you done with them? Your parents? Why would I have any idea where they are? You took them. I know you did. Tell me where they are. As Judd's words echoed into the room, the man's eyes changed. Gone was the doughy pout. Gone was the misty compassion, the gentle smile, the lemon poppy seed pretense. Poison trickled into the narrow slits. Take them? I didn't take anyone. Spittle dribbled onto his chin, but he didn't wipe it away. I don't take people and lock them away in some prison like those maggots did to you. Your, what did you call them? Parents didn't have the spine to kill you like they planned. No, instead they took you. Take, take, take. He shook his head and clutched his face with both hands. Even after you were gone, I could still hear you, feel you. But they took you so far until all I could hear were whispers. Jed backed against the kitchen door and grabbed the knob. The man waved a hand dismissively. Don't bother. It's locked. You were never going to leave this room. He sighed and sank into a chair. Jed tested the handle. It didn't move. Who are you? The man rubbed his eyes. Your grandfather and your father and your mother all in one. I'm more of a grandfather to you than this meat sack ever was. He pinched a wad of flesh on his arm and curled a lip in disgust. The motions reminded Jed of when Kaiser had done the same to him. You're the Dread King, Jed said. You're not my grandfather at all, are you? This meat sack, he pointed at his face, deserved what he got, taking you away from me, letting maggots raise you in a tunnel. Yes, it was a blue car seat. They snatched you away from me, sneaky maggots. Those things you call parents wanted to kill you. They snuck onto my boat to murder you. Spineless fools couldn't do it, so they took you instead. What kind of people steal a baby, one as precious as you? Shut up, Jed yelled. Just shut up. Where is my grandfather? Poison surged into the man's eyes. This face is not your grandfather. I am your grandfather. Not this filthy... His fingers clutched the flesh around his forearm. Sack of... He pulled the patch of skin and it tore away. Meat! Underneath the skin, hundreds of golden gears spun and whirred. The gold glinted as if the metal parts themselves had been painted in sunshine. He stepped toward Jed. Get away from me, you freak, Jed yelled. Freak? A wicked grin danced on the monster's lips. The yellow metal in his arm looked like pure gold. Every gear was as small as one from a... Jed glanced at his own arm. As one from a wristwatch. The creature took another step. I said, get away from me. You should find a place to lie down. It will be taking effect any moment now. What will be take? 
and then he felt it. A tickling sensation in his brain. The slow loris flashed in his mind. The poison, the blurry sensation, the fading consciousness. You drugged me! His foot pressed into one of the donuts and icing smeared along wood planks. You! Jed fell to the floor. All right, my friends, and that is where we're going to stop for right now. So, I don't know, this has kind of gone ping pong everywhere crazy. So Shay wasn't lying when she said that the man who looks like Jed's grandfather was not nice to her. But it turns out the man looks like Jed's grandfather wasn't really Jed's grandfather, but maybe Jed's real grandfather was a, remember the gold people turned, the gold group turned into dreads because gold kept getting a disease. So, but are Jed's parents his real parents? I mean, they are because they raised him, but did they really steal him? I don't know. We have four more chapters, I think. Several more chapters. I'll read them in one more chunk so that we can get them into manageable things. But boy, every time we come in here, I think we'll get some answers and we get some information, but it just makes more questions. All right. Can't wait to find out what's going to happen next. See you soon, my friends. Bye-bye.